Good afternoon. Thank you, Dean Sebastian, for such a gracious introduction. To President Lowe's, faculty, 2016 graduates, family and friends, I greet you in the name of Christ. I'm glad that Dean Sebastian referred to me as a pastor, for giving addresses is not my strong suit. I have one button, preach on, preach off. <laughs> so I will attempt to be faithful to the request to give an address. Robert Frost wrote a poem that is very familiar to most by the title, The Road Not Taken often called the road less traveled by, but the name of the poem is The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I could ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Well, graduates, you have finally arrived. And I'm glad about it because we need your help out here. And after years of reading and studying and praying and testing and preaching and teaching and challenging and being challenged, you are finally receiving that coveted degree that affirms both faculty and staff's confidence in your ability to now commence a new phase of your journeys that, if done well, will undoubtedly be filled with years of reading and studying and praying and testing and preaching and teaching and challenging and being challenged. None of us know exactly where this road called ministry will lead us. A few years ago, I had the privilege of being asked to speak at the funeral service of my kindergarten teacher. She had not just been a kindergarten teacher to me, but she was my next door neighbor, so I never was able to escape her until I moved away. Her name was Mrs. Hill, and she lived to be 97 years old. And when her family asked that I come back and speak at her service, I was filled with joy and flooded with memories. I remembered how that classroom felt. I remembered where she sat and how we were all arranged around the room. Here I was in my 50s, but stuck in the nostalgic moments of my kindergarten days. You see, Mrs. Hill was Catholic, and she attended the church that was associated with my elementary school. And so when I arrived back in Birmingham, Alabama, to speak at her funeral, I asked the priest, could I please have the honor of visiting my class one more time? He said, sure, and opened the door. And much to my surprise, 
I was not as enamored with that room as I thought that I would be. The desk seemed way too small. The photos were dated. And the room seemed just out of place for where I was in my life. It wasn't so much that the room had changed, indeed it had not changed enough, but I certainly had changed on my journey. I was reminded that our destination is always uncertain. And being a six-year-old sitting in a kindergarten class, with my greatest wish to have the lead in the play we were going to do for Christmas, seemed a long way from the things that God has allowed me to accomplish in my life. It reminds me of the words Robert Frost pens in this poem, The Road Not Taken. You see, on the surface, it would seem that the writer has reached a fork in the road of life and is pondering whether or not to risk the road that seems less traveled. But a closer examination of these stanzas quickly reveals the poet's description of both paths that lie before him is quite similar. Neither path appears well-worn and neither path provides a clear view of what lies ahead. The writer is clear that he must choose a path, and it is only in hindsight that Frost reflects upon the difference his choice has made. And so it is with us, my friends. On life's journey, you will encounter many forks in the road, and each time you will have to make a decision. Today, do I leave this place and seek a position in a local parish? Do I pursue dreams of being prophetic in the public square through justice and advocacy work? Will I continue to work in corporate America using my gifts and talents there, or will I be become bivocational in a church that really can't afford me full time? Will I pursue another direction completely, taking what I've learned here and sharing it with others? There are so many paths, and none of them are well-worn. The value of this moment is not so much in the path you choose, but rather in the decision you have made to go. Winston Churchill once said, the plan is nothing. But planning is everything. You see, no one knows what lies ahead. Beyond the glimpse of the road we can see, we just don't know what twists and turns our lives may take. Yet our decision to not become stuck at the forks in the road, incapacitated by the uncertainty of it all, will make all of the difference. Our decision to go. You see, many know me now because of my decision to go that most believe happened when Michael Brown Jr. was killed in Ferguson. The reality is, my decision was not made then. My decision was made when God called me to a church that had gone through several splits, whose congregation had decreased from 250 to 25, who did not know whether or not they could survive, but they wanted to give it one more shot. My decision was made when I said yes to these people that I knew God was calling me to in spite of my seminary loans. <laughs> Just keeping it real. My decision was made 
when I said yes to these 25 people, 12 of whom only managed to get to church at the same time, <laughs> and quickly shattered all of my images of myself in a Joel Osteen kind of setting. <laughs> my decision was made in August of 2013, not August of 2014. You see, August of 2013, having declared ourselves to become a church of the community so that we could serve more than our 25, we had made a decision in the midst of a gentrifying neighborhood that we would be the church that was needed for the community. In August 2013, there was a young woman who was 21 years old who was killed in a drive-by. The bullet went straight through her brain. She was killed instantly, and she had no church home. Her grandmother called and asked, could they possibly use our facilities? Being quick to tell me that they had no resources, to compensate the church. Fortunately, we had made a decision many years prior that we would be a church where such occasions would be honored. And I had made a personal decision that I would marry you and bury you one time for free. <laughs> So here we were, my friends, at this funeral because soon it became apparent as I met with the family that not only did they not have a church, but they did not have a pastor. And so in that moment, I made a decision to pastor these people. And shortly after that, they asked me, will you do the funeral service? I said, absolutely. So I had to spend time with the family, getting to know this young lady whom I had never met. And when the funeral happened, our church for the first time in my career there was filled to the brim, mostly with young people who had come to say a final farewell to this young lady who had lost her life tragically. And in the midst of those people was a young lady by the name of Sierra, whom I did not know who had made a promise that she would never come into a church again because she had been violated in the place that should be most sacred at the age of 14. So here she was in her 20s, breaking her vow only because it was her best friend that was in the casket. And unbeknownst to me, at the end of the funeral, she asked an usher for my card. She never spoke to me. I was not aware that she was there. She simply asked for my card. To my knowledge, she never visited our church. She never tried to reach me. She simply asked for the card. She never called until August of 2014 when she was coming home with her two children and the streets were blocked off to her apartment complex, Canfield Apartments. And walking in, she walked up on the body of Michael Brown. Her seven-year-old son knew him as Mike Mike. And her children and all around her began to wail. It was at that moment, my friends, that Sierra went into her apartment and found the car. 
It was Sierra who called my cell phone. Yes, it's on my card. And this is what she said to me. She said, you don't know who I am, but you did the funeral of my best friend. She told me of her promise not to ever go to church and how she'd broken that promise just for that moment. And then she said to me, even though you don't know me, you've been my pastor ever since. She asked me, as her pastor, to come to Canfield, where Michael Brown was killed. I share that story with you because it matters not the plan. The planning means everything. This journey reminds me of Abraham's story. I am a preacher, so I got to give you a little bit of text. <laughs> I lose my license, you know. <laughs> Genesis, the 12th chapter, just verses 1 through 3, says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, the Bible says, as the Lord told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham is a perfect example of someone who chooses a road. He makes three decisions in his knowing. Abraham chooses first to go. It's just that simple, to go. The Lord initiates every spiritual faith journey, and the journey begins with a divine call to go. That going looks different for each of us, but for all of us, that going is going to mean change. God called Abraham away from his former life. He says, leave your country and leave your kindred, leave your father's house, leave your seminary. He didn't say that, really. <laughs> Spiritual decisions cannot be based on location or nationality or tradition or economic considerations. They are based only on God's call. God's call to a new life and a new way of life. God called Abraham to an unknown place, the land that I will show you. He couldn't see it from where he was. He couldn't see it until he left home. And for many of you, just like it was for me, seminary, sort of becomes another home. It's a place of comfort, a place where people put up with your excuses. <laughs> and for others of you, seminary is an unknown path. But what we know about the journey is that the journey requires trust. Not confidence. Confidence will not always be your friend. <laughs> but trust. Trust the one who calls you. What is the call? God calls us to serve. God calls us into service. The word says that he tells Abraham, I'll make a great nation out of you. And like Abraham's descendants, we 
tend to hear the words great and great name, but have difficulty understanding God's concept of greatness. Our concept is often about position and prosperity. Even the disciples argued over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. But God's idea of greatness is service. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. I hate to be the first ones to tell you, my friends, but we won't all have big churches. Average attendance is somewhere between 50 and 150. No matter how they lie on those reports. <laughs> we will not all have big churches, but we can all have big ministries. And you must ask yourselves, are you willing to serve wherever and however God calls? Will you be faithful in remote places just like you would be on a large stage? Will you be faithful to churches with limited resources just as you would be to churches with huge endowments? Can you be faithful without fanfare? Everybody is not going to be happy to see you. Everyone is not going to applaud. Everyone is not going to think you're the greatest thing since the original 12. <laughs> but know this, your journey is secure. God calls us to go. God calls us to serve. God calls us to security. Not safety, but security. You see, Abraham may have assumed that God's call meant his life would be easy, but it wasn't. Security is not tranquility and ease. Security is stability in the midst of life storm. Abraham's journey clearly demonstrates that God's protection does not shield us from the heartaches of life. On Abraham's road, he encountered famine. On Abraham's road, he encountered fear. So much fear that he lied about his relationship with Sarah. And because of his lie, he encountered abandonment from those he sought protection. On Abraham's road, he made the wrong choices sometimes. He ended up fathering Ishmael with Hagar because he couldn't wait on God to work through Sarah. On the road, Abraham then had to disown Ishmael and he offered Isaac as a sacrifice on the road Sarah, the one he loved, died, yet his promises were secure. Through every situation, God proved faithful. And all I'm trying to tell you today is that there are no guarantees of where your road is going to take you. God does not call us to a life of luxury and ease. The road conditions may be hazardous sometimes, but I'm begging you, don't give up. Because God promises to be faithful. And the question is, will you say yes to God's call on your life? Will you leave this place that has nurtured you that has prepared you, that has stretched you, that has moved you beyond Sunday school class <laughs> to an understanding of the complexities and yet the simpleness of God's word. 
Will you leave this place and go? Will you trust God? The road God has for you will not show signs of wear. It's not the road that everybody else has taken, for it is a path that God has planned just for you. And nobody else has traveled there. Yet where God is taking you, you have nothing to fear. I don't tell you because of someone else's story. I tell you because of my own. That there were many who are still scratching their head, trying to figure out how and why God has taken me to the places God has taken me. There are many who wonder how a local pastor who now has 180 members, <laughs> one of which is Sierra. Amen. How God could take a little barefoot girl from Birmingham and place her in a private audience in both the White House and the Vatican. It is not because of me. It is because of God. The only part I play is making the decision to go. I challenge you Pick up this piece of paper, hang it proudly on your wall, but don't you stay there with it. <laughs> if you're serious about this work, you must go. Amen. <laughs>